Anyway, that's good. I have a whiteboard today, which is exciting for all concerned. I don't know where I'm going to put it, but somewhere there. Hopefully, Josh will tell me if I need to move it around a bit for the camera. But uh, it's all... It's all good. It's all good. Um, we do it continuing with our stewardship series, of course, and our theme really for this year is all of life stewardship. We understand it's not just about finance, but it's about every aspect of our lives, and so we're going to make sure that we keep that focus central. And uh, today I want to talk about life balance. Um, having a balanced life is a very popular concept, has been for a long while. Uh, lots of people think about that in very different ways. And I want to propose to you a biblical worldview on a balanced life today. And it begins with uh, Matthew chapter 5, or rather Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33, which is really a core verse for me and for our church and, and many believers. In uh, Matthew 6, verse 31, Jesus says... Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. There's the context of the possessions of our lives, the things that we need to be provided with in our lives. And he goes on to say, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All these things will be added to you. You've got to think about whether things are being sought primarily or whether they're being added on. That's the secret out of that passage. Am I seeking the things or am I allowing Jesus to add those into my life? Makes a massive difference to the way that we approach our lives in every aspect. The reason I've got this today, and I don't think any of these work, except I did see beforehand, I think the blue one works, so we'll give that a go. The reason I've got this is there's an interesting little um, example of this balanced life idea that revolves around a wheel and I'm going to draw this one in a perfect balance uh, with the spokes like that and this is not so much, we shouldn't see this as allocation of time because that's not really the issue. What the issue is, is what's going on in the middle of this wheel? What's going on right there? Because in these areas out the back here, we're going to put uh, family, uh, work, leisure, uh, we'll put health, well, I don't, anyway, whatever. And then we, we, our, our relationship with God, uh, the church, our community service, uh, we could go on. There's just all sorts of stuff that we can put in there. I wonder if I've missed anything uh, important. Uh, <laughs> no, that's about anything, any of that. Maybe friends in here um, or the community relationships that we have. So we've got all these things that are going on in our lives and these things are all, the, that's the, what we're stewarding in life. There are all of those things, and you might have six other things that you could identify there. It doesn't really matter. We're talking about all the stuff that's in our lives. What's critical to us is what's in the middle here. And I'm going to draw another circle down here. Same again. This time, I'm going to put it in a very different balance. And in here, I'm going to put family, work, and leisure which I think are the big three when it comes to a secular life. If I'm just living a normal secular life, then I'm interested in uh, work and family and leisure. Leisure being all the things, uh, rest and recreation, self-care, all of that stuff I would lump into there, into that uh, leisure time. And, and then over here, we would have some other bits and pieces. Now, we might want to put, you know, charity. Uh, we would take some of our community service and stuff, maybe call it a charity. Um, a relationship with God, if I have one, a relationship with the church. You know, it's, I read a fascinating thing this week uh, from National Christian Life Surveys that says they did a population survey and found that in Australia, one in three uh, young adults, age 18 to 30, will visit a church once a month. One in three. I, I was, I still am staggered. I don't know if I even believe it. But what I, did, what I did notice about it, what I do believe, is that that visit is once a month. 
Because for a long while now, regular church attendance has been classified as once a month. And so that's why I put the relationship with the church as a small sliver of somebody's life because in, in those 30 days, you know, I might spend an hour and go and visit a church somewhere or some church activity. And, uh, and then, you know, we could continue on with um, maybe a community activity here or something like that. And the difference, as I'm saying, is not about, these are not measures of time, but it's measures of focus, measures of stewardship, measures of what I'm doing with my resources in my life. And there's only one difference And it's what's in the middle here. Now, from our scripture, Matthew 6, and particularly verse 33, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added to you. So what I want to do in this one is I want to put Jesus right in the middle. There was an old uh, image, which is also a circle, and it was your life and a throne And the question was, who's on the throne? What went with it is Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And that was the catchphrase that went with this image. And so it was, is Jesus there? And I'll put an S because the other, it's not street, but the other is self. And I'll put that in here, self. If self is on the throne, then my life balance will look like that. There will be a great emphasis on my family and my work and my leisure time and the resourcing of my life. And then there'll be little slivers of other things as add-ons, the extras that I will... And I think that's how we see it, um, is that my charitable works and my other activities, they're like the little add-ons. If I've got a, a spare, if I've got spare time, if I've got spare cash, if I've got spare energy, then I'll put that into those things there and I'll make sure that they never impinge on those three big important ones. I'll make sure that I get those three important ones right first and then whatever's left over, I'll allocate to these other areas and I'll think that I'm a good person. And we say in Australia that we're generous people and we give a lot and all that sort of stuff uh, and there's some truth to that. But the reality is, If you take someone who's got Jesus in the center of their life, then all of their community service and their giving and everything else will far outweigh what is normal in the culture because God is making a change in that person's life that's releasing them in a very different way than someone who is largely self-motivated. And I could go through Maslow's hierarchy and we could talk about self-actualization and and how everybody wants to do something beyond themselves eventually. But these are add-ons. They're not core issues. Whereas for the person that has Jesus in the centre, then these other things, these slivers over here that we talk about, these become just as important as everything else. And the balance of our life is not about seeking these three areas first. It's about seeking Jesus first and then allowing him to balance our life in a stance of faith. Now, just as giving is an action of faith, All of life and all of our life decisions are decisions of faith. If I look at uh, Proverbs 3, which I shared at a a wedding recently, I don't think I've marked this one, but we'll have a quick look. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Uh, Look, I know what it says. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. This is what we're talking about today in terms of life balance. If I'm going to trust Jesus, then he will direct my path. If I will acknowledge him in every area of my life, then I'm going to exercise faith that if I give as he directs me to give, then he will provide. If I spend my energy in the way that he tells me to spend my energy, then he will make the difference. If I focus my attention where he says to focus my attention, then everything else is going to be taken care of. And that's the difference between the godly person and the secular person, whether they call themselves a Christian or not, is the secular person is still driven by secular values, but the godly person is driven by kingdom values, and they are completely different. The beginning point of that is a stance of faith, 
that Jesus says in Matthew 6. He says, don't seek after those things that the world seeks after, but seek first the kingdom of God, the rule of God in your life. And then all of these things will be added to you. And they'll be added. He says that he gives wealth with no sorrow. He talks about the fact that the generous life is made rich. He talks about all these areas and how faith stance is what brings blessing and release. And I want us to think about that today as we think about these areas of stewardship in our lives. The question that occurs to me is, how then, I'm not going to do a pie chart like this and go, what, what's an eighth? 12.5%, is that right? I'm not going to do 12.5% of my life on each of these areas, identify those eight areas and 12.5%, measure it all out. You know, if you only worked for 12.5% of your life, you're probably not going to be doing very well. So it's not about a percentage of time or effort or whatever. It, that's not what the balance is about. And I want to I want to explain today, I want to show us today biblically, how do I then find that balance? How do I do that in a godly way? So I want, to, I want us to think about that today. The first one that I want us to think about is that that balance is God taught. If you think you're going to get that balance from modern secular thinking, then you're on the wrong track. You're down here in this second circle being directed by the world. Now, I could identify half a dozen things that the world currently values that we shouldn't value at all. I could identify them very easily, very quickly. There's all kinds of junk that's going on in our world around us. I don't want to let that worldly thinking dictate to me how I'm going to live my life because that's a completely secular, self-oriented way to live. Whatever feels right in the moment, whatever I think is okay. Who said that our value system was to be directed by what we think is right? Who made us the experts on life? Who, you know, we look into a culture where war and rumor of war is rife, where relationships break down left, right, and center, where all kinds of problems are emerging in our economy, all sorts of stuff. And you're going to tell me that that's what I should be listening to for my life? I don't think so. I've got an economics major in my undergraduate degree. I understand some of that stuff. There is no chance I'm letting that dictate how I'm going to live. No chance at all. I could give you lots of examples, but I'm not going to. So I'm not going to let that dictate my life. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be God-taught about these areas of my life. Because what we notice is that every one of those areas of life is spoken to in the Scriptures. God teaches us the values that we should live by and he teaches it from his word. Let me just take a couple of those, one in particular. Oh, you know, the family thing becomes a very dominant concept in our current reality and, and, and so it should be. Family is incredibly important and is the, one of the uh, core responsibilities of our lives is our family. And so let's look at what the Bible teaches about this because it's very direct. In 1 Timothy, if you find it, Paul talks to Timothy and directs him how to direct the church. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 to 8, let's read this. Honour widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household. So there it is, the household, the family. And to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. And those of us who are getting older would go, amen to that. Um, she who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set a hope on God and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. He's talking about the church looking after the widows, but it's saying he's saying, hey, the first responsibility for the widows are the, is the extended household the household of that person that would look after them, but then the household of faith would take over. And it says, verse 7, command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's a big statement, isn't it? If you will not look after the members of your household, then Paul says to Timothy, those people have denied the faith. 
They are so far away from the value system of God that they've lost it completely. Now, we know that this era of the Bible is not talking about just your husband and wife and children, not a nuclear family that we would think about now. It's talking about a household. And a household would be, all sorts of people could be included in that household. Certainly members of our immediate family, in those days, of course, mortality rates were higher. And, and so often it would be children of uh, brothers and sisters or it might be an aging parent. It, it could be people who worked in the household, were part of that household and staff in that way. I think of Abraham who uh, had Lot, his nephew was part of his household. Um, he was concerned at one point that I think it was Eleazar, the servant, was going to be the inheritor of his household. He was a servant in his household. In those days, this household was quite inclusive. It was quite an extended family. I, I honestly believe one of the problems we have in our current culture is the individualism that represents in my nuclear family only and the breakdown of that extended relationship. I, I just think that's a, a something that the Bible doesn't promote, um, it very much promotes a, a more of a communal approach to life where we connect way beyond our immediate family. But there it is. And in another place, it's, he says, if a, if a man doesn't work, then he oughtn't to eat. And it talks about the value of work and providing for your family and all of that. So there's a very strong teaching around that in the scripture. And I could go through that with every one of these. You know, the Sabbath that is so powerfully spoken about in the scriptures from creation all the way through that the rest and relaxation of our soul is so important to us. And God enshrines that in the word. So I could go through all of those and we could find values taught by God in each of those. Now, of course, Jesus then picks up on that in Luke chapter 4, or sorry, Luke 14 and verse 25. And he says this about the family life. Now, great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Lots of us love to hate our family. Take great comfort in that scripture. No, we know that what in the Jewish understanding, this was a, a preferring. It wasn't hate in the same way that we think of it. It, was, it could be translated, it's not quite strong enough, but it could be translated anyone who prefers his parents, his wife, his children over me in the kingdom of God cannot be my disciple. This, the statement would be, if you're gonna put them before me, then you cannot be my disciple. So what is the Bible teaching about family? It's saying if you don't provide for your family, your household, then you've abandoned the faith because that's a core value of a believer. But if you put that family before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, if you put that family before Jesus, then you can't be a disciple because you've got your balance way out. You're down in this self realm here and you've allowed these things to rule over your heart and life that should only be ruled over by Jesus. Jesus right at the center. Let those values be God taught. Whatever you do, don't just inherit the cultural values that we live in. Some of them are great, some of them are awful. We've got to learn to discern the difference between what our culture says and what the scripture says. We noticed that Pat was talking there about that uh, acceptance and maybe optimism or hope or just that sort of acceptance of, of what's going on around. Now, the culture there is, of course, a Buddhist culture uh, where you're taught to just accept what happens to you. It's not actually a godly acceptance. It's a fatalism that leads to a whole range of horrific cultural outworkings that where people won't advance themselves, they won't care for other people. If someone's in trouble, they're in trouble because of their fate that has come from a previous life, etc., etc. So we've got to discern, is that a godly value or is that a cultural value that's twisted and broken as all cultural values are? Let your value system be God-taught. 
Challenge what you believe. Challenge what you think according to the Word of God. That's why the Word of God is so important to us to transform our mind and get us out of the, the, the cultural norms that we've bought into, often unknowingly. Challenge everything in every area of life by the Word of God. Let God direct that for your life. Secondly, let your life be values-driven. So we're God-taught and then we're values-driven. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into this at length, but I was reading uh, the the uh, letter to the Thessalonians, the first letter to the Thessalonians, and I love there's a bit in there in the first chapter that he says, you have received the Word with full conviction and you have become imitators of us and you've become examples to everybody around you. You can read it for yourself. It's flicking up on there, but you can read it like 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says those three things. You've received the word with full conviction. You've been imitators of us and how we live. And you've become examples to everybody around. And talks about the gospel blasting forth from them because of their life of obedience and service to the King of Kings. What a wonderful thing. Values-driven life, living out of the convictions that come from the Scriptures. But I want to read for you uh, Psalm 15. And it talks about who will dwell on the hill of the Lord. Have a look at what it says. Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? That's a phrase you don't hear very often, is it? The uh, splendour and the grass people at the moment are sojourning in their tents with great joy. Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Look at what it says. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Not, not out there. You're going to speak truth out there, but in here. What's that talking about? It's talking about this this change that needs to take place, that I will speak truth into my heart, not just the cultural norms or my own preferences, who does not slander with his tongue and does not, no evil to his neighbour, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honours those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. That's faithfulness, where it costs you something. Otherwise, it's just convenience. It's not faithfulness. I think we confuse that a lot. Had someone say to me one time, "Is I'll be faithful while ever I'm here. What does that mean? <laughs> I'll be faithful as long as it fits my schedule. That's crazy. The faithfulness is measured by when it costs me something to be faithful to what God's called me to or faithful to each other. Amazing. Uh, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent who does these things will never be moved never moved the person who is living out of the convictions that have been God taught that person will never be moved it, that person is planted by the river and the blessing of God flows in their life. That person has their life in balance. They do what's needed to preserve their relationships. They love people even at their own expense. They, they follow the teaching of the Word of God so that they live their life in a godly balance. They give what should be given and they retain what should be retained and they learn that from the Word of God and they allow that to be taught into their heart. They speak truth to their heart rather than believing the lies that are float around us. Challenge everything in your own heart and life that comes from our culture. Challenge everything according to the Word of God. If you're making a decision, if you're making a statement, does that line up with the Word of God or is that just something that you're saying because you feel like it at the moment? I think the last couple of years it has become a great temptation in the life of Christians I think there's a potential of distortion that has come in over the last few years. And if we're not careful, it will change the way we engage the kingdom of God for the foreseeable future. And we need to be careful about that and let God challenge us on every aspect of our lives so that we're obedient to what he says, not what the world says. The last thing is to be led by the Spirit. So have your values God taught Live those values out of conviction 
and then be led by the Spirit. We know Jesus said time and again, I only do those things I see the Father doing. I only speak those words that I hear the Father saying. Jesus lived his life living out the values of the kingdom of God and being directed by the Spirit wherever he should go. Because we know that many times, we talk about it with our missions program, that there are so many things in the world of missions that we could be engaged with corporately. We know that the Word of God tells us that we must be engaged in reaching the lost in the nations of the world. If we're not doing that, then we're disobedient to the direct teaching of the Scriptures to be engaged. And no, being engaged in Australia as a nation is not enough. All the disciples were told to go to the nations of the world. We must engage that in a meaningful way. But where would we engage that? Where would that be? And you've heard me say many times that in every one of our engagements around the world, we've been very clearly led by God's Spirit to engage that avenue of ministry in the world. We know the value. We know the God-taught value of engaging disciple-making around the world. We've driven by that. We've got to make a decision around that. And then we're led by the Spirit. And I want to say to you that make sure that you get good counsel about that as well because sometimes we can be deceived so easily. I often ask people, why do you think that the Bible says to test prophecy if you've always got it right? The Bible says to test prophecy because we get it wrong. That's why the Bible says to do it and share those prophetic inspirations, those leadings of the Spirit with great humility always worries me when someone thus saith the Lord, it's got to be this way, it's got to be that way. Well, how do you know? I, have, I love having these little conversations now about sovereignty versus free will. And, you know, half of the church for the last 400 years has been on either side of that little debate, and yet everyone's convinced they're right. And I'm going, well, good on you. When you get to face Jesus, you'll either find that you were right or you were wrong, and right now you don't know. That's the truth. So you'd better hold that with a lot of humility. And if I ever pick up that, that theological arrogance in questionable areas, I think you, you're, a, I don't want to call them what I want to call them, but you're that. It's ridiculous. It's silly. It's nonsense. Let's have a humble engagement with each other that allows for the leading of the Spirit and the uncertainty that we have, our small-mindedness to grasp the great things of God. How about we have a bit of humility in all this stuff? Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 says this. Brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. This is the flesh here. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Something in you will die off. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The sons of God are led by the Spirit, not by the flesh or the self. So the simple message today is, make sure life's balance is not determined by how you feel, by what the community says, by what the culture dictates, not determined by any of that. Life's balance is determined by the person of Jesus Christ and if he is Lord of your life or not. That's what determines what you'll give, where you'll go, how you'll speak, how you'll love, what you'll do with your resources. All determined by is Jesus the centre of your life or are you still living a life of the self? Challenge yourself. Speak truth to your heart and let God lead you. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your presence here with us today. We thank you for the goodness and the grace that you give to us. We thank you, Lord God, for the direction you give us in your word and by your spirit. And I pray for every one of us here today and everybody who's watching or sees this online this week, that every one of us would be challenged in our hearts about those areas of our lives that are currently out of balance, that aren't reflecting your glory and your honour. And I pray that you'd help us to come back into balance, to serve you and to honour you with all of our lives. So I ask, Lord God, that you you would move in our hearts and lives in Jesus' precious name. If you don't know God today, either here among us or online, then we invite you, come and talk to me, get online and connect with us and absolutely talk to that person in your life who loves God 
that person you know is a believer, a follower of Jesus who loves God. Talk to them, open your heart to them, let God do a work of grace. Father, I pray for our friends who don't yet know you. I do pray, Lord God, for a desire in their heart to want to know more, that there'll be a question asked about how to come to know God, what's different about us as believers, that those questions would stir up in all of those that we know that don't know you, that, Lord, you would lead us to those who don't know you and that they'll have their hearts stirred by you to open up to your Spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' Name. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Enjoy the whiteboard. It's only here for another five minutes. Then that'll be gone.